with my fellow board member, Barbara Yaroslavsky, and she has not become invisible. She has been delayed by, uh, by airplane uh, problems, but she will be here as soon as she can be and, and help me out. So in her absence, I will do my best. Please be patient with me. I'm maybe not quite as uh, efficient as she is with the, the meetings. Um, as stated at prior meetings, the mission of this task force is to identify ways to proactively approach and find solutions to the epidemic of prescription drug overdoses in this state through education, prevention, best practices, communication and outreach by engaging all stakeholders in this endeavor with a vision for significantly reducing prescription drug overdoses. Um, as some of you will remember, at our last meeting, we had a presentation on the Federation of State Medical Board's model policy on the use of opioid analgesics in the treatment of chronic pain and on a Canadian guideline for safe and effective use of opioids for chronic non-cancer. In addition, we received audience feedback on the Federation's guidelines and how those could be incorporated into the Board's current guidelines. Today, we will we'll be reviewing a draft of the Medical Board's revised pain management guidelines. Although I say revised, this document is almost completely a completely new document. And in addition, as I'll mention in a moment, uh, the pain management guidelines is a misnomer, and we realize that. After the last meeting, staff determined that the best approach in moving forward would be to put together a document based upon all of the information gathered that could be reviewed and discussed at this meeting. Staff thought that it would be more efficient to have a document to work from rather than discussing several documents, and I strongly agree. I would like to describe the methodology utilized to create these guidelines. The staff began with a simple premise that the board not reinvent the wheel or recreate what a plethora of entities have already developed. They reviewed dozens of pain management guidelines from federal, state, and Canadian regulatory entities, as well as those from several medical specialty organizations and physician associations. Ultimately, staff focused on the following publications and compared and contrasted the information contained therein. Federation of State Medical Boards, Medical Board of California's prior pain management guidelines, California Medical Association, San Diego County Prescription Drug Abuse Medical Task Force, Washington State Agency Medical Directors Group, Canadian Guideline for Safe and Effective Use of Opioids for Chronic Non-Cancer Pain, and American Society of Interventional Pain Physicians. Staff prepared a grid which separated the entity and subject matters. For example, each entity's document contained a segment regarding informed consent, so staff compared the wording from each and selected what they felt most clearly articulated change the page. What is expected of the practitioner with periodic anecdotal information or a link to additional information. Staff then extracted this information and placed it into the new document. These guidelines were admittedly more voluminous than the board's most recent iteration, which was intentional. We believe the increased detail will assist physicians who are faced with difficult real-life situations. For physicians or practitioners who want additional detail, we created links to a substantial number of supporting documents, including screening tools, pain management contracts, and referral sources. We look forward to your feedback, particularly discussion regarding some issues where we did not find consensus. For example, morphine equivalency dosing thresholds. On these is issues, which have been highlighted on pages 10 and 11, we are counting on the subject matter experts in the room to help distill out the most critical information so this document can be finalized. Hopefully, you have all familiarized yourself with the documents that were provided. Before we begin, I would like to clarify one issue based upon comments we received prior to the meeting. The name of this document will be Guidelines for Prescribing Controlled Substances for Pain. This more accurately reflects the document that has been put together and that clearly identifies the intent of the document. At this time, we would like to open up uh, the meeting for your comments and feedback on the draft guidelines. Please raise your hand and we will bring a microphone to you. And at that time, please identify yourself and indicate the title of the section you were discussing, if you were talking about a specific section, or you can speak in generalities on the document itself. We have also received some written comments, and those will be also considered as we finalize this document. We are also looking for feedback on the sections that are highlighted. We will go through those sections after we have heard from everyone who wants to make a comment. I will now open it up to the group. It's always bad if there's no comments. That means it's either so good or so bad. So I'm, I'm glad there's some. <laughs> so my name is. <coughs> yeah. 
Hello? Okay. Hey. My name is Tom Sugarman. I'm the past president of the California chapter of the American College of Emergency Physicians. And I appreciate being invited here. Uh, unfortunately, I was not aware of the previous meeting, so I hope I don't say anything oh. that's already been said. We welcome it, whatever you have to say. But I did look through the guidelines, and I have a few general comments and a few specific comments. I don't have them totally cataloged with the exact section, but I don't think it'll be that hard to figure out where I'm going. So first of all, we think and I think that the intent of these guidelines is outstanding to make it more clear to physicians and patients what are reasonable expectations and what is acceptable way to uh, treat pain, especially using opioids. But I am con somewhat concerned that the guidelines don't adequately differentiate between acute pain and chronic pain, and even within that category of chronic pain, differentiate between non-cancer pain and uh, can pain caused by malignancies. And in particular, uh, I believe it's on the third or fourth page, there is a statement that talks about what is required or what is recommended to be done for an evaluation before one would prescribe op opioids. And it goes through, it talks about the CAGE survey and a full review of systems and assessment of abuse potential and all those things. And I think that, that really the intent of that <clears throat> is for somebody who's gonna be treated for chronic pain. But I think that if you come in to either your doctor's office because you broke your arm or your emergency department because you broke your arm, I don't really think that it's reasonable or necessary to do all of those things. And I think that that person should receive uh, opioid pain medication if the doctor feels that's indicated without having to go through that whole standard. And if you leave that wording the way it is, I believe there might be the potential that some doctors may undertreat pain for fear of being disciplined by the medical board because they don't have the documentation and it's not efficient or reasonable to go through that entire long survey in certain clinical circumstances. On the other hand, I believe there should be some comments in there that explicitly say that when somebody presents, and this is typically in an emergency department, because that's where I practice, but I suspect it happens in doctor's offices also, saying, you know, I have acute pain from whatever, my migraine headache, my kidney stone, whatever it might be, and we come to the decision that we think there's a significant risk of diversion or opiate abuse, and we decide that we don't think it's appropriate to prescribe opioid pain medications to that, to that particular patient, it would be really nice for these guidelines to say that that's an acceptable decision, especially in light of the, um, I believe it's SB 791, but I might have the wrong number, uh, from 1999, that talked about the intent of the legislature is to have pain treated until it's completely gone, which doesn't totally make sense because we can't always do that. And, well, we can, but the side effects may be severe. I was going to say that. <laughs> we can't always do that without... You know. Breathing is good. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so it would, we hear on both sides from our members that they're concerned about uh, medical board investigations on either under-treating pain when they think they have a reason not to treat it or alternatively over-treating it when they don't do this full evaluation, which is just not reasonable. So both of those things, I think, should be fixed on both ends of that. And then there's a few more specific uh, comments I would have. So there's one line, uh, I believe, near the end of the document, which says that the PDMP or cures, I can't remember which word they use, should be used before prescribing opioid pain medications. I think that, again, would refer mostly to for patients with chronic pain. And I'm particularly bothered by the statement that it should be used all the time because last year during the debate for SB 809, which reauthorized the cures funding, it was clear that the legislature did not want to require doctors to look up every single patient every single time, and it was just because of the fact that the cure system is not quite ready for that amount of access. It's very slow, very uh, difficult to use, and when you're seeing patients who have, for example, a broken arm or something else, it probably doesn't make sense to look them up because even if they have an abuse potential, you're going to prescribe to them anyway because they just broke their arm and they need pain medications and the system's not ready for that. So I would like to see that particular phrasing change to should be considered rather than a mandate, especially in light of the ballot proposition that's out there now. Um, and then another small technical point, in the third or fourth page they quote the ASEP, the Na American College of Emergency Physicians National Guidelines, saying that pain medication uh, from the emergency department should only be prescribed for less than a week. Uh, it's second or third page starts near the bottom where it says, uh, emergency special population. Their emergency departments, exactly. And then I believe at the top of the next page, but I might be wrong on where it's located, they have a line that says, they quote the guidelines saying that prescription drugs shall be given for less than a week. For the lowest effective dose and for a limited duration, in other words, less than one week. Yes, I believe that is out of context. 
Um, that particular phrase in the guideline is referring specifically to chronic pain from a non-malignant cause. So again, especially with the access to care problems that we have in California, somebody comes in with a significant injury, a burn or a broken arm or something else, they may well need more than a week of opioid therapy from the emergency department. And then that brings me to my next point where it talks about any more than three visits. Again, that really isn't a hard and fast rule because typically most of us are giving very small quantities of medications hoping patients can follow up. But if they come back because they don't have access to follow-up, which unfortunately happens, it may require more than three visits to get them through their acute pain episode. So there should be a little bit of leeway in there without the doctor feeling like they're going to be subject to a medical board investigation and discipline. Um, and then the final point I'll make, which this is not my field of expertise, but I really do like the section where they talk about side effects of opioid pain medicines near the end, in particular the section on constipation, which is a common problem we see side effects from. I would think this would be an opportune time to insert specific language that are most appropriate for op opioid therapy. The ones that I most typically see, obviously these are the patients who fail the therapy, are on inappropriate laxatives because only certain laxatives work to counteract the opioid-induced constipation. Thank you very much. Excellent review. We have a taker. Good morning. Scott Clark with the California Medical Association. Uh, thanks again for your hard work on this issue. Uh, I know in the, the work on our paper, it took quite a bit of time and effort, so I understand the challenge uh, before you and, and appreciate all the hard work. I'd like to think of the challenge before us. Yes, yes, <laughs> agreed. So a couple uh, comments sort of organizationally. Uh, I submitted a few, a few thoughts in advance, which I know you received, um, but still looking for some clarity in terms of how the guidelines are intended to be used. And I think you see some of the tension or confusion or lack of clarity in the document because it's not, maybe not clear to, to, to all of us. Uh, for example, how some, at some points it's very general, and at some points it's very specific. So as, as Dr. Sugarman just pointed out, in some cases, uh, it's really hard to make something that applies to all the specialties and all the scenarios. And so in some ways, a more general document allows for that flexibility that's needed uh, on a patient-by-patient on a -patient basis in all the various settings that physicians will, will need to, to address, uh, address pain. Uh, so uh, it might be helpful to, to address that early on in our conversation to understand the intent of the document. Uh, if it is in, intended to be uh, to help physicians understand how to how to work with pain, then some additional resources on um, uh, might be might be relevant to include. Uh, it, it might be good to reference things, for example, uh, about including the current education requirements for pain management, the uh, the new requirement under SB 809 to have all uh, prescribers be registered in cures by 2016. Uh, guidance on how to make uh, appropriate uh, referrals to specialties, guidance on uh, uh, additional guidance on patient abandonment, uh, supervision of allied health professionals, possibly even a discussion on the role of corresponding responsibility. These are the topics that I think I hear, hear physicians that, 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 that we work with kind of looking for additional information and we really appreciate that form of, of guidance. In addition, generally speaking, the, there's a couple different sections that deal with red flag behavior, and it's, uh, I think there's three or four locations where there's lists of red flag behavior, and they're not all consistent with each other, so we need to be careful, I think, that uh, we're sending a consistent message if we're going to be talking about that. And then just collectively, uh, we need to be careful, I think, with, with the shoulds that are in, in the document, because they may collectively serve to present a impossible situation if, uh, or an, an unreasonable situation where there's so many shoulds that maybe are in conflict with each other or not appropriate for a specific situation. So in California Medical Association's uh, guidelines document, we made it clear that it was not a standard of care uh, and, and did use should in our document, uh, but under the understanding that it was, you know, very, uh, uh, it was not to replace a, a, the, the standard of care. I have some additional specific comments, but I think that's some, some general, general reactions to begin with. Thank you. 
Thank you. It's always a challenge, I think, and I think we'll all agree when you're trying to create a document to capture something even simple but certainly as complex as this to balance out the the generalities with the specifics, isn't it? I think that's that's the main challenge. It's very easy to write a, a one million word document that's unusable or a a ten word document that is also unusable. So I think that's our real challenge here, isn't it, to try to get all the people who are the experts in this room to come up with something that that guides our physicians because the vast majority of physicians want to do the right thing we want to take care of our patients that that's a given and we end up writing language in law it doesn't seem like for that one tenth of one percent of individuals in whatever specialty or or work environment that want to do wrong or so i think it's a good challenge and thank you for bringing that up Yes, Ms. Kirchmeyer would like to make a comment. Mr. Clark, we would like to ask you, you did say you had additional comments. Um, we really would like to get those comments, so would you put those in writing to us then? Sure. Okay. We would like to hear all, de you know, pretty I much I was feverishly everything, writing, so. but I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yes. Good morning. Uh, good my morning. Name, my name is Joe Zamuto. I am the uh, president of the Osteopathic Medical Board. Thank you for coming. My pleasure. And uh, I had the good fortune of being in Denver for the Federation of State Medical Boards uh, meeting. And uh, this, of course, was uh, a very important hot topic among all the other topics. And uh, coming away from that meeting, um, this concept of uh, having these guidelines, um, I think we're never meant to be punitive in its conception, but was meant to be, number one, protective for the patients, uh, number two, to educate the physicians who deal with these patients, and to have a construct in that um, we protect patients from themselves in terms of educating them. Uh, and the processes of whether we're doing urine testing or blood testing, uh, having a, a surveillance where the patient knows we care enough about them that we want to make sure that these medications are not harming them in any way, that they become receptive to uh, engaging in their best of health. Uh, the important things about causation of pain uh, is important to patients because they don't understand why we can't just take a narcotic and take care of all pain. And sometimes you have to sit down with the patients and educate them, well, narcotics work on, in the brain. We have other medications that work uh, peripherally. We have some medications that work uh, in the musculoskeletal system. And with that, the, the patients then uh, understand why they may be taking uh, three or four different types of medications which are providing them with alleviation in those different systems. The specifics about um, uh, taking a guideline and making it uh, standardized is so critical so that when you go to McDonald's and you order a cheeseburger, every McDonald's gives you the same cheeseburger. So too, when you go to a physician in the emergency room, the surgeons, the family practitioners, that when they treat pain, they uh, treat it in the same uh, general context. The not best practice is context, I think exactly. is what you're saying, yes. Right. Understanding that it's not a cookbook. Exactly. And I think that <clears throat> when we look at uh, disciplined physicians, um, had they been educated ahead of time, they might not have made the mistakes that they had made. And, of course, that's a different discussion rather than the, uh, the diversion and abuse that occurs by the bad actor. But getting back to the patient uh, uh, needs and the patient's care, I think that uh, the more we can spread this information out through the societies, through the medical meetings, through uh, webinars, um, and as you know, there is a, a, a free CME offered through the Federation of State Medical Boards that uh, people can take online to educate themselves about the utilization of uh, extended and long-acting. Uh, and I think part of it is we need to let the physicians know that those educational programs uh, are available. I get no compensation for that comment, by the way. 
<laughs> merely an observation. But I, I think that uh, it's, I, I want to applaud uh, this group because we have many different interested parties who are represented here. And I think that we get the best product by getting the most input from all organizations and we want to achieve a common goal. Um, my uh, concern, of course, is that um, uh, education, education, education. So uh, let's continue to do a good job, and I thank you. Amen, and I applaud that. I think I'm hearing a, a chronic thread through this uh, education of we on the medical board as we help to create guidelines, education of the consumer, the patient, and the education of the physicians so we're all in concert to, to do the right thing. Thank you. Uh, Lee Snook. Uh, I'm a solo practitioner doing pain medicine here in Sacramento. I've been doing that for about 25 years. And i like to applaud uh, the committee for putting together an excellent report. I think we're well down the path of developing something that's useful for our clinicians to help protect both the practice of medicine and safety for our patients in need. Uh, as a, as a chronic pain specialist, I've had to go through a variety of variations in training from internal medicine to anesthesia to pain medicine before there was ever a recognized board in pain medicine to addiction medicine and, and most recently medical review officer certification. I've had to do all of that stuff, uh, you know, and, and if I had time I should go back and uh, get a law degree and also a, psych a degree in psychiatry and behavioral health and cognitive behavioral therapy and all that kind of stuff. So. I, I want to emphasize that the specialty of chronic pain medicine is indeed a specialty and it's extraordinarily complex. So I want to emphasize that our best medical practice is one patient at a time, one physician or provider with one patient, and each treatment plan needs to be individualized. There are many different uh, uh, you know, pitfalls, I guess, that, that we have to be careful about, like the uh, access to treatment in an emergency room that can be coordinated with a primary care or primary treating physician such that we can limit the amount of opiates being prescribed. Keep in mind that we're transitioning from an opiate-based chronic pain management mentality to other modalities. And that is addressed in this treatment guideline. Cognitive behavioral therapy is very important. One of the problems is access to that. As you're well aware, uh, trying to get a patient into uh, counseling and or psychiatric management because many of these chronic pain patients have significant comorbidities of the alphabet soup of the variety of the various psychiatric disorders you can have they must be addressed as a comorbid condition when you're managing chronic pain one of the reasons we're in the situation we're in now with, em with an emphasis on opioids is because of lack of authorization or acknowledgement of the needs for other non-opioid treatments that include the uh, psychological behavioral health which is a critical part. I would say it's the, it's, it's the thing that needs to be emphasized over everything else, is the cognitive behavioral therapy. And other interventional therapies which are addressed in some of the treatment guidelines. Now I do want to say that the document that's going to come out of the medical board is going to be a document used by a broad spectrum of people including enforcement. So we have to be very careful how prescriptive we are. It is a guideline for, you know, sort of a best practice for us that it needs to be general. And it should reference other treatment guidelines from recognized authorities, which you started out with, because the state of the art's likely to evolve uh, quicker than this document may once it's published. Now, in, in terms of the monitoring part, I wanted to emphasize that this is still an evolutionary process, you know, of compliance monitoring for a worker who is working on the Department of Transportation has very specific you know, there's 100 pages of regulations that address the very specific protocols and how you monitor biological fluids and in what time do you do that. In the clinical practice, it's, it's evolving as to when we do qualitative uh, urine drug screening or biological fluid analysis and when, when we do quantitative. And I can tell you from a, uh, from a medical review officer perspective, it's far more nuanced than we, we, we may care to understand or recognize at this time. So it, it is important we're doing compliance monitoring. Not only is the patient seen on some timely basis, not only is there good faith physical examination, review the medical records, the records, et cetera, the things that we commonly do uh, in the practice of medicine, but in addition, those patients that are chronically administered controlled substances, 
the providing physician does have to access a prescription, an electronic prescription monitor program. That's essential. We all agree with that. It's just how we do it. Likewise, uh, compliance monitoring does include timely biological fluid monitoring. Now, this, this tends to be a problem with a lot of practitioners because everybody will say, I trust my patient. Well, I trust my patients too, but you may have heard the phrase trust but verify. Uh, there is a small percent of patients that are creating a very large problem for all of us. Diversion is a very, very difficult to tell when people are doing that. And the only way, the only way to tell is to do uh, compliance monitoring screening, and that includes urine drug screening, and it has to be a true random urine. And random urine means that, or biological fluid means that, the patient receiving the medication isn't aware when that test is going to be performed. In any of our monitoring programs for people that are in a substance abuse a diversion or health program, compliance monitoring with true random biological fluid uh, assessment is a critical component to the monitoring of that, that uh, individual under treatment. So we do want to emphasize that we could perhaps uh, tease out a little bit more detail or emphasis on some of the, the monitoring. And um, other than that, We'll submit written comments, too, uh, but I think this is very good, and I really appreciate the work you put into this. Thank you. Thank you for all the meetings. Thank you very much for your continued support. I appreciate it very much. Um, I, I, as, as we've had many speakers here, Ms. Kirchmeier, it, it, it comes to mind that I, I'm hearing a lot of fear from our practitioners, uh, the fear of, of intervention by the intervention by the, um, uh, the enforcement division. And, and I can say from my two-year, rather brief uh, tenure on the board that I haven't seen an egregious um, enforcement uh, over overzealousness uh, with respect to this issue, certainly. But I, I wonder if we couldn't perhaps, as part of our education process as we go through this, have a, have a presentation by someone from our enforcement division to kind of give, give the, the public and the physicians an idea of what those behaviors are and w what sort of egregious behavior we see that ultimately does come to enforcement because the, the rank, I think, I believe, and tell me if I'm speaking out of turn, I, I believe that the rank and file physician out there who's in good faith practicing is unlikely to uh, f be disciplined as long as they, they follow along with best practices. But again, I think that uh, I'm not the one to uh, say that ne necessarily, but you might comment on that, Ms. Kirschmeyer. Um, it kind of goes back to something actually that um, the California Medical Association brought forward and that this document really are, are guidelines. Um, you still have to fall back for the standard of care. And when we take enforcement action against any physician, we find an expert in their field, and I'll ask Ms. Sweet to add on as well, but we find an expert and it goes to that expert and it really depends on that expert opinion that comes back. Um, and they're going to be reviewing all of the medical records. I'm a physician interview and everything so it really these are really intended to be guidelines um, they're not the beat all end all in that you still have to follow the standard of care I think that um, Dr. Snook's statement, and I wrote it down, so I might, if I quote you later, I'll have to give you credit on it, but, you know, the, the best practice is one patient with one physician at one time, and, you know, you, you, we want people to follow these guidelines, but there will always be times when you're looking at a patient that you may not necessarily be able to follow these specifically, but you need to still follow the standard of care, and I'll look to Ms. Sweet to see if she has anything to add. I, I absolutely agree, and it is, we do look at the cases, one patient, and particularly the patient circumstances and what the physician had to deal with at the time. So we realize that there are a, a plethora of circumstances that each patient brings. So our expert is charged with standing in the shoes of the subject physician and saying, did this physician meet the standard of care in light of all these challenges faced? So I do think, though, that the, the comment and recommendation about having a more uh, broad emphasis on the fact that these are guidelines, and maybe we could even add something to the effect of how the enforcement process works in context with these guidelines to, to um, assuage physicians. I would also comment on at least the, the cases that I've seen. The vast majority of these cases that come before me for all reasons uh, often a component of it, unless the physician was actively trying to do something bad, was that they didn't clearly document why they did something. 
they did something and there was a long history, and again, Ms. Wheat, you can comment on Ms. Kirchmeier, but a lot of the, the problems occur when people, there's a long history of patient visits. The physician never really documents why they made an intervention, why they changed intervention. Just common things that we would normally do when we learned in medical school, but somehow they dropped off in our clinical challenges and our busy practices. So I would just say that that goes a long way to, to um, make it easier to, to defend yourself. And, and when the expert reviews the case, if they see this, say, oh, clearly this is what Dr. Snook was thinking and this is why he did this and that makes sense to me rather than just random changes. So I don't want to take the meeting in that direction, but I just wanted to, I want to try to help to minimize the fear. I, I don't think the intent here is to try to catch anybody out. I think we want to protect the physicians as well as the patients by, by giving some education here. And I think education is a key. Yes, please. I just want to make one follow-up comment. I appreciate what you're saying about the enforcement and how it is, and I think maybe when I was speaking, I was using my words a little bit loosely. One of the problems that our physicians face and other physicians face is that when a patient complains to the medical board that they were not treated appropriately, it seems like automatically that mandates that the physician has to write a letter of explanation of why they provided the care they provided. And it seems to me that while I understand you need the medical record, you have to get that from someplace, it seems that maybe before you ask the physician to hire a lawyer, write the letter, and be in fear that there's going to be discipline down the road, that maybe the first step would be to look at the medical record. And if the medical record already clearly documents why they did what they did, and it seems to follow the guidelines and the standard of care, that perhaps at that point you don't need a response from the physician. Because that part, even though it ends up not being a disciplinary action, it ends up getting closed, that still creates stress, fear, and takes the physician away from his or her practice, meaning they can't provide patient care while they're responding to that particular complaint. And that's, I think, the fear that, the that our group of physicians have and other physicians have with these type of guidelines coming out, that if they're too prescriptive, that they're going to be subject to an investigation. They may well end up not getting disciplined, and they don't think they will be disciplined, but just the fact that they have to respond with a lawyer and a letter is a problem in and of itself. And that is a challenge, and it's probably out of the scope of the meeting today, but I, I recognize that and, and appreciate it very much, so we'll, we'll take that comment to heart. Dr. Uh, Dr. Sugarman, just so you know, the reason that letter comes in and actually um, back in the, I'm looking at Susan, Katie's in the room, she's in, Susan, um, probably 10 years ago, we would have never written to the doctor and asked them for a letter. However, um, Business and Professions Code 2020.08 came into the medical board and it stated that prior to sending out the documents to a consultant to review, because obviously we don't have the expertise to review these, we're not physicians. So so the law states that we have to ask the doctor for a letter um, identifying their care and treatment of that patient before we can send it to a medical consultant. So that's why that request goes out to the physician. So it's by law that we have to do it. There's a certain few exemptions, but for the most part, that's why that's required. So I understand the dilemma that it puts the physician in, but that's why it's requested. Anybody else with comments with respect to the prescribing guidelines. Yes, sir. Um, hello, thanks. Uh, my name is Stephen Henry. I'm a general internist uh, and pain researcher at UC Davis. Uh, and um, I just had a couple of uh, specific comments. Um, the first two had to deal with um, what someone else mentioned, that there's a lot of appendix appendixes and making sure that uh, the guidelines are internally consistent. So one thing I noted that the um, the dose, uh, maximum dose of Tylenol is inconsistent between That's the, been noted by many, yes, sir. And the, um, another um, uh, potential confusion, I thought, was uh, between the section on patients with substance abuse disorder and Appendix 1. Um, so Appendix 1 uh, states that patients who have an active substance use disorder should not receive opioid therapy until they're established in a treatment recovery program or alternatives are established, such as co-management with an addiction professional. Um, and I think the, uh, the language uh, in the main document um, is a little more unclear, and um, uh, it talks about uh, for patients who are actively using illicit drugs, the potential uh, benefit uh, of opioid therapy is likely to be outweighed by potential risks. Uh, and I think the, the appendix uh, language is much clearer and more straightforward. Um, and then I have uh, two additional comments um, uh, for consideration of uh, 
uh, adding something, and these have to do specifically with uh, long-term opioid therapy for non-cancer pain uh, in the primary care setting. Um, one has to do with a section on uh, psychiatric patients, and I think it would be worth commenting that um, patients who are on long-term opioids are at increased risk for depression, and uh, patients, when you're considering and or monitoring long-term opioid um, therapy for patients, that they should be um, screened for depression, and if uh, they have depression, be treated. Uh, it's sort of mentioned very, uh, the PHQ-9 is in one of the documents, but it's not really discussed in detail. Uh, and the final comment that I have is in terms of uh, the dosing recommendations, I think a, it would be prudent to add a comment uh, about the uh, dose, uh, the increased risk of overdose relate, um, opioid related overdose and death uh, with high dose opioids. And uh, they, you know, as the document states, there's not a clear, obvious threshold, but the literature would suggest that certainly if you're taking more than 100 milligrams of morphine equivalent a day, um, you're at a statistically much, a much greater risk. Uh, and I think that that should be documented uh, in the guidelines. And if uh, consideration of higher doses, when, you're at, when you are at high doses, that should be um, prescribed with additional care to the patient or uh, strongly consider uh, involvement by a specialist rather than uh, being treating that in the, in the primary care setting. Specialist meaning someone like Dr. Snook, for example, right, who's right. a certified pain specialist. Exactly, a pain specialist or addiction specialist, something like that. Yeah. Again, we get into the shoulds and the considers and all that, but uh, that, that's a valid comment. I wonder, uh, um, I don't know if I should put someone on the spot, but I wonder, I haven't heard any, I know we have some of our, our colleagues from the Board of Pharmacy here. Does any, anybody have any general statement they'd like to make with respect to the, the guidelines? But I'd love to hear what, what your thought of the general thoughts before we get into any specifics at this point in time. Because reading your comments was very good for me, the things I never would have thought of, and I, I really appreciated that. And those were from the, um, the Pharmacy Association, not from the okay. board. I'm sorry, sorry. my apologies. All right, so you hearing me now? Yes. Uh, yeah, no, the Board of Pharmacy, I have not had an opportunity to see those com uh, oh, okay. these guidelines until today. Uh, so you must have heard as, as I, I, mi I misspoke then. It was uh, Pharmacy Association. Pharmacy Association. Well, nevertheless, we welcome uh, your input at, at some point in time. We think it's critical because this really does need to be a team approach. My name is uh, Donna Gray Bowersox. I'm with the California Department of Healthcare Services, uh, the medical review, which is part of audits and investigations. So yes, we do enforcement. We are also involved in education and outreach. And at this point, we cover close to one third of the people of California. So we look at it from both the professional, because we need the professionals, as well as protecting our patients. A couple of suggestions, because I know that in guidelines you're trying to reach not only the practitioner, but once you publish this, this will be viewed by consumers. So a suggestion I would have is you may want to index it. So that would help um, not only perhaps some education for consumers, as well as maybe even, dare I use the word titrate, but that starting with some general and then going into some of the specifics. I like that you link to other documents as well because that um, presents a wealth of information. Uh, one of the things, and our staff will use this as a guideline. We're not going to use it as an enforcement tool, but once we know something is published, it helps to then reference it. And again, unfortunately, we sometimes deal with some of the outliers. Another suggestion, um, 
that I would make is to put together either a glossary or be very clear when you use any type of initial that it is in fact explained first because we can all assume what it means. Um, and that we also like the appendices. That's something that is, is very helpful. Dr. Kinzer and Dr. Hurd, do you have anything that you might want to add? Two of our medical consultants are with me today, and they deal with these issues on a regular basis. Thanks for taking the time to come, by the way. One of the things. Um, Please stand and, and let some, us see you and tell yeah, us who I'm, you are. Dr. Nancy Hurd, and I'm the um, lead medical consultant for the medical review branch. And um, some of the things that, some of the concerns that I had have already been raised. And one of um, the the big things was that um, the the theory of pain management. It, it is an evolving field, and I think that we need to reflect that in in uh, the educational parts of it about you know, what pain is and what causes pain and what the different kinds of pains are. It's kind of phrased as though it is an absolute and you know, physicians know that it is not an absolute and that these things do change over time. And so I think that we need to make that clear in, in the narrative. Um, Overall, I did have uh, trouble with the, the flow that sometimes it's very, very specific and sometimes it's quite um, vague. And there was one particular part where we talked about where it actually, I can't remember what page it was on, but it actually referenced being vague and said we may be vague. And I really didn't understand that, that reference at all, so I think it might be difficult for some others, maybe not everybody, but for some others. Um, Dr. Kinzer, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Well, I have this opportunity. This is Ms. Yaroslavsky, our other co-chair, who is, was unavoidably detained, but she is here now to add her wealth of abilities. Welcome. Thank you for that generous <laughs> introduction. <laughs> wow. I'm uh, Dr. Donna Kinzer, also from the Medical Review Branch. Uh, I looked at this document. I think it's a good start. Uh, I think there are some areas for improvement, including um, balancing it out in terms of information, as was mentioned earlier, some too general, some too specific. Uh, as was just said, we will be looking at this as a rep in uh, our reviews and uh, this document compared to before in some areas is more specific and is so is beneficial. Uh, for example, when to initiate a pain treatment contract, uh, but it became less specific in other areas such as the frequency of visits and the monitoring such as the urine drug testing. So I appreciated the comments from earlier uh, that included emphasizing those areas. I will be submitting some written Recommendations. You read my mind. I was going to ask both of you to please send those in so we don't miss anything. Uh, one other comment that I would like to make as somebody who has treated Medi-Cal patients in the past, and I think that it's very well and good to say that we need to consult pain specialists and we need to activate um, you know, some of the behavioral and psychiatric, but we do know that there are doctors, there are Medi-Cal providers out there, primary care physicians who don't have access and are kind of strapped. So I, I appreciate um, the, the format of, um, you know, things being recommendations and this is ideal practice, but perhaps we should also reference that when people are unable to do these things that you know they sh their documentation should reflect that you know they have considered that and why or why not they have um, been able to do that all right is there anyone else who would like to add anything uh, i see we have another hand up oh. yeah we'll where are we on the we are um we are at this part and we're doing the audience comments. Lee, Lee Snook again. Um, yeah, the... 
Could you identify yourself, please, sir? Uh, Lee Snook, uh, solo practitioner, Sacramento Chronic Pain Management. Uh, right. yeah. Yeah, also with the California Medical Association uh, and a bunch of other entities I could talk to. Uh, the, the issue that was brought up is a critically important one. So in our evolution of understanding chronic pain management, those of us that are in, a, in the specialty sphere end up doing uh, opiate analgesic therapy, chronic opiate analgesic therapy, because that's kind of what we got. And you can use some psychotropics, you can use the, you know, the constellation of combined chemotherapies, what we refer to it. But that, in absence of uh, a cognitive behavioral, behavioral, help, uh, behavioral health approach, is really not the best situation. And, you know, and, and after 25 years of doing this, I'm coming to the understanding how critically important it is. So what we're saying in these guidelines is we're moving away from opioid analgesic therapy. We're talking about sealing doses, or not really sealing doses, but doses where we're recommending a referral to a, to a consultant. The net effect of which is going to be to reduce those opioids. We have to replace them with something. So and we're moving into the post-opioid world, which I think is appropriate. I think that's what we should be doing. There are places for it but not across the board. So going back to the individualization of treatment, uh, in, in evaluating your patient, what's critical in our, in our treatment guidelines is an emphasis on risk stratification. And this goes back to the primary care, you know, what are the comorbidities that you, you, you put them down in your problem list? What are the comorbidities? And that determines who your referrals are. And you make, have to make a good faith effort to get a referral. You know, if you have an addictive disorder, that means a 12-step program because you don't have any money. And that's just the way it is. So I'm constantly telling people, look, you know, uh, well, I can't afford that. Okay, fine, I understand. You don't have the money, but there are, there are other alternatives, you know, in, in how, to, how to achieve that. Uh, if you have, uh, for the medical providers, and this is really difficult, because uh, I, I see some of, the, some of those patients that really are strapped for resources and really have difficulty getting into behavior, behavioral health, health, you're basically taking away something and not replacing it with something. That doesn't work. And it puts, it puts a really an oppressive burden on the primary care physician, which we need to help. So, you know, the specialists kind of shun because they don't want to assume medication management because that's what the referral always is, assume medication management. Okay, now I get to deal with how do we access the behavioral health and all that other stuff. So I think that part of the solution here is to emphasize that we need to improve access for behavioral th health. And that's one of the, you know, we've talked about essential health benefits benefits of part of our Covered California, essential health benefits of part of the uh, Affordable Care Act. Behavioral health is a critical component of dealing with the chronic pain patient. It just is. And so when we're approaching them and saying, look, maybe you don't need to be on 200 milligram or whatever it is, equivalents, morphine equivalent dose, what are we going to do for you? We're going to use non-opioids and we're going to do other things that have to be credible, reasonable, and accessible. So th that, I think, is going to go a long ways for us being successful in our, in our intent. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, this is open kind of back. So before we continue, and I apologize for being late, but it was way beyond my control. Let me just ask a question of the previous speaker, um, because you hit on something that I've been trying to figure out how to put out there. What I heard you say is that we have to depend more, collaborate more with other medical professionals while we're dealing and treating the patient. Is that, should that be part of what we are focused on? Should that have a stronger focus on what we're doing that we should be able to say we want to recommend um, that if um, certain specific doctors are seeing certain specific patients for certain specific treatments that there might be a need for collaboration with a um, mental health, a uh, behavioral health provider um, that insurance companies should be promoting the ability to be reimbursed for that kind of a treatment. I mean, where, uh, go down that path with me for a couple minutes and help me out here. Thank you. Uh, it goes back to risk stratification. So if you're a primary care physician, family practice, the OBGYN, mm -hmm. pediatrics, internal medicine, the vast majority of your patients it, with the risk stratification are going to be a relatively manageable risk. And so in that population of patients, we don't want to be too oppressive in imposing all kinds of uh, regulatory burden that the primary care physicians just simply can't do. They can't do. They won't be able to treat the patient. It's too much work. Um, so as, as we risk stratify classes of patients, 
if you go to the extreme, it's well accepted uh, worldwide that multidisciplinary, multimodality treatment, you know, or a, you know, a, a, a multidisciplinary approach is superior. And that includes, at a minimum, some type of behavioral therapy approach, some type of physiotherapeutic approach, and some types of uh, physical medicine approach, th those kind of things in combination. We, I, I just got back from the American Medical Association, and, and one of the things that the American Academy of Pain Medicine proposed as a resolution was making pain management, multidisciplinary pain management, an essential, an essential health care benefit. And, you know, we, so we've got this issue going on of prescription opioid abuse, which we're, CDC calls an epidemic, uh, and everybody's kind of calling it an epidemic. What are we going to do about it? How are we going to address it? And, and simply saying, well, we're going to take away the opioids is not likely a solution. Now, that seg I'm going to segue into something else, and that is the, the whole problem of substance abuse. In, in the uh, risk evaluation of the patients, those patients that have a history of substance abuse or psychiatric comorbidities, they're in a higher stratification. They're going to require tighter monitoring and more frequent interventions like urine drug screening. Now, I also do quantitative blood levels because we're moving into a period uh, where we're going to have to assess impairment. And currently, the only way we assess impairment for, for a substance is with alcohol. So we have a pretty clear uh, compendium of toxicology and all kinds of stuff with alcohol, but we don't have it for anything else. We don't have it for cannabinoids, uh, which we've kind of legalized, more or less. We do not have that. We don't have a blood level that tells us if you're sober or not, if you've got medicinal marijuana or, wh or whatever. And we don't have it for any other medicines, including the opioids or, or the other stuff, and we, we need to be moving into that. So I do uh, the, the blood testing as well, although that's not considered a standard. I, I, I think it will be at some point. But most certainly, if you're not doing a qualitative urine drug screen or some type of uh, you know, saliva or something in your office, and you're not following that up with a quantitative analysis, you're missing all kinds of stuff. And let me tell you what that primarily is. It's methamphetamine. Methamphetamine is a huge problem in our society. And the only way you're going to know about it is if you look for it and you can't look at your patient and say, you're an obvious meth person. It doesn't work like that. Every one of your patients is a potential methamphetamine abuser or substance abuser, and the only way you're going to know is to test for it. You can do the risk, the tools that we're, that we're suggesting, which you need to do. You know, those are metrics that we incorporate into our medical records, so we're appropriately assessing, um, you know, risk as we go ahead, but, but we have to do a little bit more than that. That's why we have these complementary interventions. The, the cognitive behavioral therapy part, going back to your suggestion, allows the patients to, to approach this in a non-pharmacological, non-interventional, non-surgical way. It's actually cost-effective to do that. We're actually going to save everybody money if we, if we emphasize that, but, you know, I, that's what I'm suggesting because I have a difficult access to that as well. You know, we, well, we don't, don't do shrug it. your shoulders. I'm right there with you. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Okay. I mean, you know, I'm kind of apologizing because, geez, no. you know, I want to get people better, but I, I got what I got, and I, do, you know, use what I can. Uh, but I, I recognize the huge need for us to have that that modality available. Okay. So. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes. I. Okay. I'm Louise Bailey, and I'm the executive officer for the Board of Registered Nursing. And I want to thank you, Kim, <laughs> and, your, and your staff and all for uh, producing uh, these guidelines. Because as you know, we have thousands of nurse practitioners who have DA DEA numbers, and they do furnish opioids. So this is going to be, some, this definitely will be some help uh, to them, because I think this is a very important issue, and I'm very happy that I'm here. Uh, to hear all of this today. And if you think it's appropriate, I would like to send these oh, to the president of the uh, Nurse Practitioner Association to see if they would like to have some input or anything into this, uh, because this is a very important subject area. So if it, that's okay with you, I didn't want to send them off to them if that would not have been the appropriate thing to do. But I think it's important so that nurse practitioners too are looking at these guidelines and whatever comes out of it, that they too will follow them. 
because you know many nurse practitioners are working in clinics by, without physicians there because the physician only has to be available telephonically uh, for nurse practitioners. So we need to all be in this together and working together. I so I will send these to that nurse practitioner organization and see if we have any other input, okay? Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. Excellent, I'm, I'm informed and gratified by all the help everyone's been giving us this morning, this is great. Um, in the absence of further sp general comments, uh, I think that we want to return to page 10 of the document. There's a few sections that the staff would like some specific input. And I, I notice we don't have page numbers on here, so. We do on the one that in the back. <laughs> okay. After we send it out, we're like, okay, okay this isn't going to get us. Okay, this is so okay great. All right. So it says here, due to concerns over the number of pills being prescribed to opioid naive patients, staff thought that a maximum number of pills should be referred, referenced in these guidelines. However, we need input from the subject matter experts as to what the number should be or if there should be a number at all. What staff was trying to avoid was the opioid naive, naive patient who goes in for minor surgery and walks out with 90 Percocet or oxycodone. Are there comments? I think I know what the comments are going to be now after listening to everybody else. <laughs> one patient, one physician, one episode. But are there any general or specific comments anyone might have with respect to should we put numbers of pills prescribed per event or per incident or per episode? Is that correct, Ms. Kirschman? Am I, am I addressing the essential concerns yeah. you had? Yeah, if you look at um, page 10, the right under dosing for opioid naive patients, you'll see that there was a statement there, and it start with a short acting opioid with a maximum dose of four times per day, not to exceed. Blind and that's pills, where yeah. we were kind of looking for what type of feedback we would receive to put in that section, or if we should even put in a number. Um, again, we know that you know, specificity is sometimes not your friend, um, but neither is generalization sometimes. So Let me take uh, the, one of the chair prerogatives and say in my practice I don't prescribe medications uh, for outpatients, but as an anesthesiologist I see an incredibly wide disparity in the response of individuals to narcotics, and it's, it's almost unpredictable for the naive patient. In fact, I prefer someone who's not naive, then I have an idea. But uh, please, uh, let, let's hear from the well, others. Are we? Okay. What I was going to suggest, and this is strictly from a consumer standpoint, understanding that, again, there are going to be a lot of viewers of this document. You may want to start by defining what you mean as opiate naive. And the reason for this is as we are dealing with some significant societal and health issues, we need to tone down the debate. And so a consumer, well, I'm not naive, and that's not what you're trying to convey. So again, what you may want to do is start with either defining terms or explaining why we look at things differently if a person has not had um, previous experience with pain uh, or opioid medications. And then the other thing is with your list itself, unfortunately, you've left off some of the ones that in part of our world we see on the street. And some of this in terms of the OxyContin, the, uh, now we have the Vicodin, the uh, long-acting Vicodin. And so if you're going to specify, well, I didn't mean to bring you all <laughs> you to You brought the, the house department. lights down. <laughs> Definitely toned down the conversation. Yeah, automatically. It's very mellow now. <laughs> so, but, but again, I appreciate what you're trying to do, but it's almost you may want to um, put that in a different area and, and give it more explanation. Thank you. So wait, 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 let me ask you a question. Don't go anywhere yet. Looking at that section specifically. Yes. I understand what you're saying about toning down the conversation. Yes. But the people that are going to be reading this are either going to be doctors that need some advice or want clarification, or some, parent, uh, some patients that are looking for clarification for what they want. So we have the two, 
two, two groups. So the issue is there is a certain number that the um, professionals, I assume pharmacology, doctor, drug companies have decided are appropriate dosages. And we're not looking for patients to go and say, I need four of these because it says I can have four of these. So how are you suggesting? So more than, give me some, some what would you like to see in here instead of what you see? Well, to start with is, is you're also going to have attorneys, you're going to have lobbyists, right. you're going to have pharmaceutical reps. Um, you publish, and at one time in a former life I worked with the medical board, so I appreciate that once you put something out there, it has an infinite number of uses. Right. So the first thing is to explain the context and the definitions. Then if you are in fact, and this is where I think uh, there's been, um, and Dr. said it so well, one patient, one doctor, one situation. Because um, my husband who has a serious illness, they have those. and the doctor will ask him how he is, and he always says it's a two. But they were and that's because he doesn't want to complain. So when you start putting in, you should have this number, what I would instead recommend is say, consider um, here's a baseline. However, if you're unsure, um, here are other resources for you. But I don't think what you want to do is try to limit in a document um, that it's X. You can refer to, here is the standard that is um, suggested. Generally accepted. Generally, okay, exactly. But I would caution you from trying to come up with an absolute. So is it best to know the number to stay below? Is it best to not have a number? Well, I, I have a I have another suggestion because I, I can see you're, try, you're trying to look for some some sort of number, some sort of range. Uh, but I think the point is is well made that you'll never. I'm sorry. And this is Scott Clark with the California Medical Association. Apologize. Uh, you're never going to be able to capture all of the drugs on this list. New ones will be introduced. Things will drop off. The science will change, maybe right after this is published. So to capture those numbers in the guidelines, I think is maybe doing a disservice. However, if you're really anxious to sort of say, well, what's what is the, you know what are some examples out there? You can cite other examples. You can say, for example, the San Diego Prescribing Task Force recommends these amounts. There may be other examples to reference. So I wouldn't necessarily internalize those numbers, but you can point to other organizations that provide some guidance on that. Okay. All right. Wait, there's another no, question. was there a comment? I'm sorry. My apologies. Hi, uh, Dr. Richard Reamer. Um, formally presented the Canadian guidelines. And thank you again for that. <laughs> uh, just one quick comment. I, I agree that it's difficult to, uh, uh, to be proscriptive in terms of the uh, specific number of pills that are prescribed. Um, language that I like, uh, and, and somewhat based on the neuroscience of pain, is that disorders uh, that uh, uh, require the use of opioids for acute pain have a natural history. And uh, it's oftentimes the natural history of that disorder which dictates how long an individual can reasonably expect to uh, experience pain. And we then balance that off against other epidemiologic information, such as if you're an individual who's been treated with opioids and remain on those drugs for three months, there is somewhat of a 70 to 80% chance that you will remain on those drugs by five years. And so uh, as you start to take a look at, at this, I, I think that as Dr. Snook said, and everybody keeps repeating it, and I think uh, he's going to need to trademark this, uh, <laughs> uh, one patient, one doctor, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll, the rest of you can fill this in. But I, I think that's where it, it's useful, uh, that um, it is a matter of having an understanding as to what the disorder is. If uh, one group, uh, are there dentists in the audience? Uh, uh, if we were to take a look at the uh, three major groups that are responsible for the greatest prescribing of opioids in the United States, it's family practitioners, uh, it's dentists, uh, and uh, internists, uh, and um, 
uh, we see that, uh, that information uh, all the time. And so when you have your 18-year-old having wisdom teeth removed, should they leave the office with 30 Norco? Uh, what's the natural history of this? And where do those drugs end up? Typically in the medicine cabinet because the child becomes nauseous and would rather just have an ibuprofen or an Advil. So uh, the science hasn't caught up with that, but my, my recommendation might not be to be as proscriptive, but to change the language to reflect that the, uh, the number of pills uh, should be a reflection on the natural history of the disorder and that the frequency of follow-up would also then dictate uh, refills. So if you take a look at some of the, uh, some of the recently adopted um, uh, guidelines from some of the uh, federally qualified health plans like San Francisco or Petaluma, uh, what they're doing is giving about a week's worth and making sure that that patient then returns for reevaluation. Those are my comments. Thanks. Okay. Wait, but he said something important. Wait, you said something. Wait, I wanted to ask you a question about it. I'm just trying to remember how to ask what the question was with what you said. You said something about if a patient is taking a certain, a certain kind of drug, after a certain amount of time, the likelihood is that they will be on that drug for five years. Correct. I want to just ask the question, if, if doctors were to read that, if practitioners were to read that, if, if it were in our guidelines, would that make people take a second look at what they were doing? Absolutely. And I have to believe that it might. So I think that what, I don't remember exactly what you said. At my age, there, I there, No, that's forget, okay. I, I, in fact, at my age, I don't remember what you said so I, I said. could. Uh, <laughs> Pardon me? Let me she consult. Says, she doesn't remember either. You said something Dr. very Zabuto. good, though. No, so it, it's Please that, send us the reference so we yes. can include that. I think that's, that's an awesome yeah. idea. It, it's at three months. Uh, so at in, three months. Uh, in, uh, that if you, and, and my colleague from UC Davis may want to comment. Uh, uh, no, I, uh, I, I can send the reference. I think the, uh, it, it was, uh, the finding was, um, that uh, for people who take long-term opioids and stay on for non-cancer pain, uh, if they stay on them for 90 days, two thir about two-thirds of those patients will still be on opioids years later. Um, so I, I think that's a, uh, it's a good, good comment, and it's something that's uh, affected my practice a lot. Just uh, to uh, piggyback on a couple of very good comments by other people, as far as I can find in the the research literature on non-cancer pain, there's not a well-accepted definition for opioid naive um, in terms of, uh, you see some uh, publications will use six months or one year, but there's not um, uh, a clearly accepted uh, standard definition. It's a little bit clearer for cancer-related pain, I think. Um, and uh, just uh, one other comment as well. Uh, in terms of the guidelines that do provide specific uh, dosing recommendations, the Canadian guidelines and also the VA Department of Defense guidelines. Um, you take some digging, but they have some tables, specific tables um, that give specific recommendations for not number of pills, but you know milligrams per day or something like that, uh, prescribing. Uh, and that may be helpful uh, for this, uh, you know, for, I think, this level of specificity, I agree, is like, may change, you know, and I don't know why uh, tramadol is listed as a high abuse potential, but um, Percocet is not, for example. It's, uh, it's, uh, I don't know that the, the evidence would bear that out. So anyway, thank you. Yeah, hi, hi my, my name is Dr. Yuli. I'm with the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs. And um, I just have a, a few comments. Um, one is this actually very nicely outlines the responsibility and, and rights in some ways of the prescriber as well as the patient. I think it's done a very good job and it really lines up a lot with the policy that um, they've developed at the VA. Um, I, I think one thing that would be very helpful is um, for the first 15 years of my career, I was with the Permanente Medical Group, and now I'm with the VA. So I'm very familiar with integrated healthcare delivery systems, which has a fairly high penetration in California. And those will probably increase as we go into um, healthcare reform. And uh, it, it would be helpful if there was some comment on what are the responsibilities of an integrated healthcare delivery system. Uh, for example, it's sometimes very hard to get physical therapy and, and other modalities for patients. Um, and so I think that would be helpful. Uh, the other is, um, you know, when patients are 
um, taken off um, opioid therapy because of problems they've had with therapy, in particular addiction and the like. Um, is there a, um, some criteria for reentry um, or reconsideration of putting them back on opioids? And that's something that we really haven't figured out. And then the third is um, what is our duty to report um, when we see someone who may be a uh, notor uh, notorious diverter, um, some information about that also may be helpful. And that, that's it for my comments. So what I'm hearing from you is that in the VA system, there is um, the ability to determine the levels or the numbers or the prescribing pills that you can, that are okay. Is that correct? Um, no, I didn't. Uh, I didn't. You like that. this, but it, it, you like this format that we have here, and it does reflect what the VA is doing. I just went to the next step. Right. Um, you know, I'm not familiar. Well, I've seen that table, but I'm not particularly familiar with it. And it's um, those things are sort of for um, uh, helping the prescriber, and they're not um, that you have to prescribe in this fashion. Um, but and, but you know, they're useful those um, tables and the like that. Um, so the table as we have it here, you feel is useful? Um, you know, I'd have to go over it um, again. I, I just felt the document was useful. That's what I meant. Oh, thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. All right. So I, I just want, wait, I apologize. I just no, wanted, no, 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 I, I was looking at my notes that I made on this. I get comments too. I get comments too. Um, what I noticed in the dosage of for opioids, that there was no discussion on the, the need to do liver function tests. And I saw throughout the do document that there were situations where it, it tied the dosage or the drug to problems with the internal functions of other body organs. And I'm not a doctor, but I do, I've heard of liver function tests and I've had them. So I'm wondering is, should that be part of the dosing of, if you're gonna do this, then you also have to make sure you do that. I just wanna know from professionals if that is, some, yes if that's something that should be considered. It's part of the document as well. Good point. Well, you know, I first trained in internal medicine, so you, you measure everything, okay? That's what you do in internal medicine, whether it's appropriate or not. When you do your initial consultation, before you initiate opioid therapy, you have to do a good faith physical examination. You have to do a thorough, thorough historical evaluation. You need to review the medical records. Usually that includes imaging studies, Blood, blood studies and that sort of stuff. But generally, you have, when you, when you start treating a patient, you do a comprehensive metabolic panel. And that includes uh, hepatorenal function and you know, all the other stuff that you would use in a, in a primary care practice. Cholesterols and alkaline phosphatases and a battery of LFTs and all that kind of stuff. And you do a complete blood count. And you need to probably do a urine analysis. And then you might do specific tests depending upon what you're looking for. You know, thyroid stimulating hormone or that kind of stuff. That would be your basic stuff. Now, what you need to measure going forward hasn't been defined yet. Okay. We just made up every six months what we did. And, and we made up every six months quantitative blood levels of the prescribed medications. So I know that if you're on methadone, no matter what the dose is, you're going to have a blood level of 40 to 400, 500, 600, 800. And that becomes important because I'm seeing the patient on a monthly basis because when you're prescribing Schedule two, you kind of need to be doing that. That, that's part of the risk stratification depending upon other factors, but generally it's a monthly eval. Um, and we're doing a functional assessment on every office visit by talking to the patient, having them fill out a patient interval questionnaire. And we're also doing an assessment of clinically meaningful um, improvement in pain. Now, I, I need to add also that the Division of Workers' Compensation does have posted on the DWC website a four-part opioid prescribing proposed treatment guidelines. And um, I'm a member of the MEAC, the Medical Evidence Evaluation Advisory Committee. I love alphabet soup. It's great. <laughs> uh, and so we, we considered all these concurrently, what the CMA did, what the division is doing, what the medical board is doing, so that there would be an agreement. We don't, we don't want disagreement. It get, granted, the DDPC is dealing with the injured worker, and that may be where some of that statistic, you know, in the injured worker beyond a certain time frame, it's pretty well known in occupational literature that if you're at 90 days, then, you know, the die is somewhat cast unless, unless we get better at how we're intervening and determining what we're going to do. But 
the basic principles of initiating opioid therapy, assessing effectiveness of opioid therapy, and discontinuing opioid therapy. And the discontinuation of opioid therapy, if the trial hasn't been successful, as determined by metrics, is still in evolution. We're still working on that. We, you know, my addiction colleagues would say, you know, you pain docs, you know how to take the airplane off. You really do know how to take the airplane off the tarmac, but you don't know how to land it. And, and that's why we've tried to reconcile addiction medicine and pain medicine so that we, we have the complete treatment plan. Thank you. If that's helpful. I believe there was a, another issue uh, brought up by staff in regards to the maximum for acetaminophen. This has been addressed today. We know the FDA says 4,000 milligrams per day, but others have stated that it should be 3,000 milligrams, and some companies are putting that in their labeling. Are there comments on what that number should be or whether there should be a specific number in our guidelines? Yes, sir. Just, just leave him a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> well, so this is going to be a bit, um, we've been doing, uh, just from a clinical standpoint, okay, I'm not, uh, I'm, I haven't published any of this stuff, so I'm giving you personal experience for 20 years of doing this stuff. <coughs> Acetaminophen is an important analgesic, and that's why, in part, it has been combined with opioids, either a, commonly a hydrocodone or an oxycodone preparation currently. When you remove the, the acetaminophen from that combined preparation, the effectiveness of the medication draw, falls off dramatically, and you end up having to increase your opioid dose by at least 50 percent. So that's been my clinical observation. Second clinical observation is the dosage of acetaminophen when chronically administered is extremely well tolerated. My cohort of patients is two-thirds Medicare and one-third workers' comp, roughly. So you can kind of think about the demographic of what that represents. Older patients with high comorbidities, we routinely, before we knew any better, gave four grams of acetaminophen a day, six, eight, 10, 12 milligrams a day, way beyond what the FDA says. We would monitor hepatorenal function in specific indicators of liver toxicity, which we use was a GGT or the gamma glutamyl transpeptidase. That seemed to be an, a sensitive indicator of liver dysfunction long before there was any elevation in the AST or the ALT. And that kind of has been born through clinically. So in my practice, I think that acetaminophen is an extremely safe medicine, extremely well tolerated when it's administered throughout the course of the day over a long period of time. Having said that, if the FDA comes out and says three or four, I think that our guidelines should defer to, you know, defer that dosage to the current clinical thinking amongst the hepatologists or the FDA or whatever. I would, I would avoid putting a specific dosage on there. Yep. So just comment that, that the FDA has recommended yeah. the, the certain dosage? Yeah, I, I think, I think the, the whole, uh, you know, in, in the development of this, that we refer to other authorities like, you know, the Department of Defense, the Veterans Administration, it's a very good document. The uh, Canadian Opioid Treatment Guidelines, a very good document. And some of the other societies that we've referenced in the in development of this, very good documents, we should refer to them. Uh, I, and I agree with what was previously said, we want to be careful about putting a certain dosage in, because that may evolve. You know, right now there, there's been a trend to, to push acetaminophen down. I, I don't know why, because I, I don't, I clinically have not seen that as a significant factor, but that's my cohort. That's not everybody in the United States. Maybe there's other intelligence out there I'm not aware of. But I, I would tell you uh, it, that it's a relatively safe medication, so I, I wouldn't be apoplectic about, you know, if we, like, like it's been said, if we say three grams a day, that's going to become uh, you know, benchmark, it's etched in the sand, and nobody's going to be able to go beyond that, and that's, that's unfair to many patients. I mean, many of the elderly patients simply, you know, acetaminophen is something you can still buy over the counter. So it's readily accessible, it's cheap. And, and we've got to remember, people have limited incomes. And, and that's why preservation of some of these low-cost analgesics is important. Not just the opioids, but the non-opioids. And acetaminophen is one of those medications. Would you agree it, it, that we should put something as the effect of if the cumulative dose exceeds this, that we should do any testing or do any closer monitoring? Would you yeah, leave that you, out? We would say appropriate risk stratification is indicated. And, and with that as the implication, you may need to do blood tests and that sort of thing. 
case. So appropriate risk within the guidelines, if it were to have a statement, an over a general kind of a statement, that this is the recommendation of either the FDA or whoever, but you as the medical provider need to be aware of this, and I'm not, I'm the, it's a cart before the horse, the heart, you know, so I'm not sure where I'm going, but exactly that there's some kind of a, a statement couching that you as a provider need to be aware of these, but if you're doing what you're doing appropriately, then you should be treating the, the patient to the best of your ability. Exactly. Recall that most of the long-acting opioids have black box warnings. Many of the medications we use in chronic pain management have black box warnings. Many times uh, we have to exceed the dosages that are recommended by the FDA, again, titrated to a specific patient and a specific circumstance. But that means that if you're going to do that, then you have to enhance your monitoring. I, I think the issue is is that not every doctor that, that's, or prof, prof, excuse me, medical provider, I don't mean just to limit to doctors, but not every medical provider is going to either know what is the ballpark or is going to be aware that if they do this, it's going to be okay unless we say something. So the object is how we say something so that not, not the pain management, not the anesthesiologist, not the normal, the these kinds of doctors, but the general population of medical professionals are aware that there are certain limits, there are certain standards, but if you're doing the right thing and you need to change that or you need to tweak it or do it to your the best medical knowledge you have, that's okay. We're not looking to put we're not looking to put lawyers in business, okay? We're not, we're not trying to make it so that this is going to help. We're going to try, we're trying to do it so that medical professionals have the tools that they need so that I just want to hear from you that it's, you would feel comfortable with an overarching. Well, I, I, yes, I am comfortable with, with uh, an overarching treatment guideline. These guidelines are primarily directed at primary, primary care physicians and right. allied health professionals. Right. Right. I mean, you know, I've, I've always used allied, worked with, used, I've always worked with allied health professionals in my practice. It's a critical, important part of our ability to meet the needs of, 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 me, of medical care for our patients in California. So all, all people that are prescribing, that have a, a, the ability to prescribe scheduled, have to have access to these things first. But secondly, the, it has been a long-standing policy in, in, in the medical board that I know, as long as I've been involved with being a consultant, is that... Any physician, if they feel like they're outside of their uh, comfort zone, refers for a consultation. I, mean, I do that all the time. You know, I'm supposed to know all this stuff. Well, guess what? I don't. The more I know, the less I know. So I have a lower threshold for referring to a psychiatrist or you name it. You name it. So the, if, if you look at other treatment guidelines like the uh, AM... Uh, GEA group from uh, Washington State, the Association of Medical Group Administrators. They have a treatment guidelines directed specifically at family practitioners because in the state of Washington, if you're an injured worker, you can't find a pain specialist to prescribe a scheduled substance. You ne necessarily have to go to a primary care physician. And that treatment guideline has a, 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 a suggested yellow flag dosage of morphine equivalent dosage, which states if, you, if you're treating uh, patient X and that patient gets up to this amount of milligrams of morphine equivalent dosage in a day, you really should refer them for a consultation, a suggestion. We strongly suggest. And that's the guideline for the, for the primary care provider. So, you know, this guideline will be directed primarily at them, but, but um, so if, there, if you're uncomfortable, then you have to seek consultation or, or strongly suggest you seek consultation. Just to avoid your sitting down and standing up again with another question. You also said that uh, you, um, on a monthly basis, do all this testing or, or seeing the patient again or reviewing the charts. And my question is, is there an issue as far as reimbursement for those? Is that a normal, is the monthly visit with a doctor or medical professional when you're prescribing opioids, normally a monthly visit is what's appropriate and are you being, it's appropriate, are you also being reimbursed for that? Or is this, I'm trying to, it, it's, the answer to that is it's, it's in the context, it's contextual with the stratification of the patient you're seeing. Uh, if you're seeing an injured worker, there's a reporting requirement of every 45 days, something like that, 30, 45 days. You kind of have to see them as a primary treating physician on a regular basis, whether or not you're giving them controlled substances. Now, I, I want to clarify, we're not doing testing. Uh, in terms of blood tests or urine drug screening on every visit. That's not appropriate. No, but you're, what I'm asking basically is, are, 
it, your ability to see a patient is not being hindered by reimbursement. Maybe that's a better way of putting it's it a, out there. It's an evaluation and management code, and, and you generally you get paid for evaluation and management. So no, uh, that's not being hindered. But you know, I'm not going to go into the workers' comp issue. That's a whole. Other, I'm, not, other I'm, thing. So I'm not talking about workers' comp. I'm just talking in general. I, you're only you're not only a workers' comp doc. Yes, ma'am. Yes, you are only a worker. No, no I not. see about two thirds of my patients. Okay. Are not, so my not issue is just for physicians out there and medical providers out there that are prescribing certain kinds of drugs. Are they able to see the patient and check out in with them that they are doing okay and they're the medication is working for them or not working for them and they're having that conversation on a regular basis that they need to have and are not being impaired by anyone else? As far as I know, that's not an issue. Good. Uh, okay. An office visit on a monthly basis is generally recommended. That's what you need to be doing to be monitoring clinically meaningful improvement as a, as a benefit of your medication and some measurement of functional improvement. Thank you. Which is, which is still being developed. But that doesn't mean that you do a urine drug test every No, visit. I'm not no. suggesting what you should do. I just that you can do whatever you need to do. Yes. Okay. Yes. Hi. Well, Rich, we have someone that was, was uh, hand was getting tired. <laughs> Richard Reamer. Um, just to mention, uh, uh, the recommendations from the FDA and the CDC regarding acetamin infant toxicity was based on epidemiologic information from a number of sources. And on average, uh, there are about 55,000 emergency room visits a year for acetaminophen toxicity. There's about um, 25,000 uh, hospital admissions. And there's on average uh, between 500 to 1,000 uh, cases of acute liver failure per year in the United States, of which 50% are due to acetaminophen. Uh, so the, so uh, the, the risk is uh, obviously uh, uh, based on this surveillance data. Uh, which inform these recommendations by the CDC and the FDA. Uh, a, another comment uh, for the treating physicians is that oftentimes, while we're aware that acetaminophen uh, is combined with other agents that we're prescribing, patients are going to the pharmacy and using Tylenol, they're using NyQuil, uh, uh, a variety of other uh, over-the-counter preparations which then increase the risk. Um, something also important to recognize is that um, uh, there are genetic risk factors for acetaminophen toxicity, and we don't typically test for things like glutathione deficiency. And so uh, sudden acute liver failure uh, that I have seen uh, has occurred only after 24 hours of exposure, in one particular case, uh, a young high school student uh, that I can recall who uh, was using it for a sprain and uh, ended up on the liver transplant uh, uh, mm -hmm. ward. So uh, it's not always related to dose, as uh, Dr. Snook was uh, indicating. So it, it, is, uh, it is a, uh, a topic that is obviously debatable, but this is where the recommendations come from. And, and so I think informing physicians about this risk uh, becomes, becomes important. Thanks. Well, I think with some qualification. So, you, so your turn is up now. I mean, it's... So my, <clears throat> my name is Tom Sugarman. I'm the past president of the American College of the California chapter of the American College of Emergency Physicians. And just going back to the question earlier, I like the idea that somebody had that rather than a specific number of pills when you're initiating opioid therapy, consider a length of time. That makes a little more sense because then it allows you to adjust based upon when you're going to recheck the patient. And I would think, you know, I don't, I don't do chronic pain management, but you know, a week or two or three for a newly a patient who's now newly using opiates makes sense to me. Um, in the section that you're referring to on the previous page where it says initiating opioid trial, I, I would recommend changing that title to opioid trial for chronic pain since that's what they're talking about in the very first sentence. But that said, I do think that not all of these recommendations in the terms of the dosing, but some of them would apply to acute and would make sense to maybe include acute, uh, dosing recommendations for acute uh, pain because they're really quite different. Um, in terms of the Tylenol, I agree that we should be recommending limiting the dose of Tylenol based upon the epidemiologic data and what the FDA has said, and maybe just refer to the FDA and just put a year in there for that. But I would put a specific line in there about cumulative acetaminophen dose, because I think many physicians miss that, and many of the overdoses we see in the emergency department are due to patients taking multiple acetaminophen-containing drugs. Uh, what else? Uh, if you're going to add a section on acute, then I think uh, for acute pain dosing, 
then I think weight has to be a consideration in addition to age. And in the top paragraph, there's no discussion of weight at all. I don't know if that applies for initiating chronic patients or not. Uh, and then the last point I would like to make is if you're going to list specific risks with tramadol, which makes sense to me because people are a little bit less familiar with that, and it was sold not that recently as kind of the panacea to all opioid-related problems, I would specifically include the risk of seizures, which is the most significant and common problem that we see in the emergency department. And I would probably soften the word where it says do not use if the patient has liver disease or renal disease to um, if they have significant renal disease or liver disease. Because that absolute is probably not uh, correct. I just want to add a comment of mine as we go forward, uh, Ms. Kirchmeier, is I think something should be included here that uh, it uh, we may have something already, but we should be clear as we produce this that these are intended as guidelines, not intended to definitely uh, proscribe uh, certain practices and less dangerous. But I, I also think we should include um, that that we strongly recommend that deviation from these guidelines uh, should have a documented um, rationale behind that. Uh, so it's clear to, to everyone, allows the physician or the uh, provider to think what they're doing and also um, may prevent disciplinary action or, or anything in the future as long as something has been documented. You're aware of this and this is why you're doing it because it's the right thing to do in this case, this patient in this instance and this doctor. I think that that would be helpful to, to for our education's sake. And you, some people may agree, disagree with that and that's fine, but I think that should be included as well. I think the other thing that you had here at the bottom of page 10 and top of page 11 is the comment indicating rather than provide specific examples and numbers, the board could make more general statements. Well, I think we've kind of discussed this in many venues throughout, unless you think there's something more specific we need to discuss, Ms. Christian. I think we've discussed the, the conundrum behind that, perhaps generalities. I think we should go through the whole document and, and try to be consistent with general versus specific uh, to make it more of flowing and easier to understand. And that, and that comment in there, I know there was a question from, I think, Dr. Hurd about, didn't understand the comment. This was a comment to the reader. Um, I see. We, we, yeah, <coughs> we weren't sure whether we should list this as it was. This is actually came from the San Diego County um, Prescription Drug Abuse Medical Task Force. So this was actually taken verbatim from them, I believe. Um, and with a couple additions in here and so that was we didn't know if we should do something like this or if we should just kind of leave it vague but I think there's been enough um, explanation here as long as we have it why we're doing it it's okay to put that specificity in there and it's helpful for physicians I believe so and I think we also have to put um, uh -oh, we have to give here credit we here we go with the lights we have to give credit <laughs> to the um, those entities that have in fact made these recommendations that everyone knows who they are so it gives more validity to what we've written as well. That's not the Medical Board of California suggesting this. In fact, it is specifically the VA or the wh whoever is doing it so that the reader will understand yeah. that there's data. Yes, yeah, and we put that in there. And hopefully we can um, link to all of that as well. Right. That's the plan. The one question we did have is actually on the top of page 11. And this came, um, I know we've gotten comments that, that it's inconsistent with the 200 milligrams per day of morphine. And then on the back page, I think we had had a quote from, um, or a section we had taken out of CMA where it was 100 milligrams per day. And that's something that I've seen. Um, Washington State does it one way. Others do it differently. At this time, I'd like to ask the, the physicians and the experts in the room really which which one is it according to your standards or what you've seen in your reading and everything because we'd kind of like to make comment that's one that I think that it needs to be in here maybe I'm mistaken and I'd like to hear from you for that but that's one um, I've seen it both going both ways and so I'd like to hear your opinions on that or not <laughs> You want to split the difference? <laughs> no, they're going to turn Hello, hi. Uh, Stephen Henry from UC Davis. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's a good point to, to put uh, uh, recommendations about a, a dose-related risk of overdose and death. Um, as uh, my colleague, uh, the gentleman, previously mentioned, some of the, the guidelines are um, based on epidemiologic uh, data. Um, and 
they differ. There was a recent, uh, if you look at the, the literature and guideline synthesis, sort of guidelines from five years ago were probably recommending uh, 200 milligram, you know, 200 milligrams a day of morphine. More recent ones probably recommending sort of 100 or 120 milligrams a day. Um, and uh, I think uh, it's sort of, uh, so I, I would sort of, as a primary care doctor, sort of say, you know, 100 and 120 milligrams a day was, is where you should start uh, strongly think about uh, consulting, referring, um, uh, and certainly there are, uh, you know, I've treated patients on higher doses and those are specific patients. There's long conversations about the risks and whether they're willing to accept the risks and, um, um, but that would, sort, that would sort of be my comment on that. There, there is an opioid dose calculator that's made available by uh, the vendors and, you know, uh, various resources where you take all of your opioid analgesics that a patient might be on and you come up with a single morphine equivalent dose for a day. The idea of a cutoff dose has been very controversial. Uh, there is no significant inflection point on the epidemiology of this. And some of this comes out of the uh, Washington State Department of Labor and Industry. Uh, the medical director, Gary Franklin, uh, presides over the uh, single payer system workers' comp in the state of Washington. So he's access to all of the injured workers and all of their prescription data and has done a lot of the research on this. And he showed that there's type, uh, you know, kind of like a parabolic arch on this. It's no one particular set point. There's been a fair amount of debate about what, it, what that is. As I said previously, the, uh, the guidelines coming out of Washington was the, the, the document from the, you know, Association of Medical Group Administrators was directed at primary care physicians. And the, uh, I can't remember the dosage, if it's 100 or 200 or whatever it was. It's a yellow flag is what it was. It wasn't a red flag. It's not a, this is the limit. Uh, you know, you all know in the, in the audience it's been interpreted as a maximum daily dose. That's not what it was intended for at all. It was a guideline, a yellow flag, yes. Yes. proceed with caution. We should refer this patient for an expert consultation to determine if this is appropriate or not. And that's what the dosage is. So in that context, whether it's 100 or 150 or 200, it's not that much difference. Keep in mind that, you know, uh, anything beyond four of a hydrocodone preparation a day, you start getting into that dosage relatively rapidly. So it is a low threshold for referral for a consultation, which, which may be appropriate. Right. We just get, go ahead and get into the issue of access. Exactly. To uh, cons cons consultants. And that's, we, gotta, we have to be cognizant of that because we're going to be putting the primary care community in a very difficult position. I, again, I wonder if that could be satisfied with a statement to the effect that once you reach this dose, careful consideration of the risk-benefit ratio should be made and, and clear and concise rationale behind your dosing would be important to document if you feel that'd be uh, relevant. Uh, yeah, and I think, I think that's how actually Sam I had mentioned it. It was a red flag to see over the 100 mil. And so maybe we can word it. Yes, actually, I think they use red. But we'll yellow, use flag. <laughs> yellow, fit, like yellow flag. Yellow card. <laughs> Um, Ms. Kirschmeyer, you can shoot me in the head for this. I, I know we're, you we said don't something in bring here. Guns to public meetings I know, I, I spent it speaking metaphorically. But something about we do not plan to hold another meeting. I just wonder after, I feel so good about this meeting again today as I always do. I wonder if we, if the budget would allow, if we'd consider having maybe one more meeting like this after we've come up with the next iteration. Because yeah. I do think the comments today have been invaluable. and. I, what, what is the, the crowd? I'm going to do this. Everybody who feels like another public meeting like this with the next iteration would be helpful, please raise their hand. Okay, good. I, and I, we, I, were, we were basing this off the comments we had received oh, today. I understand. And no. So we were kind of like, we don't really have too much. So. Yeah, okay. but I think, I think we've nope, come up with a, a good, I think we've come up with some, some general topics that need to be addressed in a general way about the general and specific things in our, in our uh Document. So I, I thank you for considering that because I think it'd be very helpful for everyone. And we, we certainly do want to have more comments. And if you want to read the script uh, or have any more to say, Barbara, you're welcome to do so. This was this okay. Was so I want to just make sure before I go forward that <coughs> there's nobody else that feels that they'd like to say something that hasn't had a chance to say something, but wants to, 
or has said something in the past and wants to say something now. We just don't want to pass up an opportunity mm -hmm. since we're all here in the room. Yes, I see two hands. Yes, Thank you. Good. Hmm. Make it good I, just a question. Yeah. Uh, has the committee decided on that morphine equivalent dose per day? I think we're going to have taken, uh, I think that we're going to have, again, we're going to have like a, um, a couch term that you need to be careful of and that there will be uh, links to whatever the two uh, groups that have decided what is appropriate is appropriate and that there be a, a suggestion that maybe you, if you're going to do more, you better be careful and think about it. But, but we haven't defined what that yellow flag level Well, is. I think it's going to probably be, I, 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 we haven't decided, but I would venture to say that from my perspective, it should be a lower number, not a higher number. Because it, it, the object here is for us to make sure that the person that's reading this and using this for advice is the person who might not be in the same situation that you are in currently with your information and your data. We're not talking about the experience, pain management, the, exp it, the, the you know, you, you have to realize that that the rules are being written for people who don't know exactly what it is. Not the rules, the, 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 the dialogue, the guidelines. So we're not looking to look, you experts know what you're doing anyway, right? So we're talking about the people that don't know what they're doing to, to help them know better what they're doing. Yeah, I think, I think that's. So that's what I'm, where I'm going. Yeah, I think it would be. Sight and scene. Mm -hmm. I think it would be I helpful to, right? okay. to reference that epidemiologic data and mm. happy to provide that to you, Please. which, uh, does just take a look. Uh, it's by inference that these these levels uh, were uh, determined uh, because every patient's independent and idiosyncratic. So some are very safe at uh, doses quite a bit higher. Exactly. But, but we but but the data suggests that the number of emergency room visits, the risk of overdose, occurs five to six times greater once you pass that inflection. If there are you always outliers. There's always outliers. The outliers. We're not, we're talking about the mainstream normal right. opportunity to right. do what you need to do. We're not talking about the... And, and, and uh, just one other comment, uh, just to emphasize the fact that this needs to be general and user-friendly. For every uh, pain physician in the United States, there's 28,500 patients. Uh, we don't write the rules for the rest of the United States. We write it for California? Yeah, no, just in general. The just in general, the, the but we have more people in California than they yeah, do in the, the rest of the country. The, so. the, ratio, the ratio is the one to 28,500. If you're a radiation oncologist, the ratio is uh, 240 patients with cancer to one radiation oncologist. So you can see the just pointing out that disparity and the issues of access and, and the fact that whether we like it or not, it is the primary care physician who, who will be taking on the greatest burden in uh, applying these guidelines just based on numbers. Exactly. There's a gentleman behind you, I think that, a woman, I can't see you, but I can see a hand. Hi, I'm Fran Thank you. Burton from the Dental Board. Um, ah, Dental Board. Excellent. And um, I, I wanted to say that the speaker before me has contradicted himself because he did say earlier that the prescribers were um, primary care physicians and dentists. And, um, you know, now he's saying that they aren't. So, but I don't think that that's, I don't think that's true. That's a gotcha. Um, I do, I, I wanted to say that um, as a result of the drug summit, that we are yeah. looking very seriously as a board at what we need to do. And one of the reasons that we are here today is to look at how we can begin to model these Great. guidelines to something to our use. Good. And I'd like to emphasize what I've heard several times, and that is that this is not user friendly. That it doesn't, it, it, it should be a document that uh, if a, m a member of the public picks it up, should be able to understand it. And when I read through it for the first time, um, it was partially with the dictionary for that reason. It is not user friendly. And I would also caution against the use of acronyms and uh, initials. But we're here to listen and we're here to learn. And um, we appreciate that opportunity. Thank you. So I want to thank you for that. Because, but be assured, when this document is, is finished, I'll be able to understand it. And if I can understand it, anyone can understand it, okay? So please, thank you for those comments. But definitely, um, you, we'll get there. Okay, thank you. It's for the physicians. It is for the physicians. But I'll still have to understand it. 
Okay, so now I, I've given everyone the opportunity, I assume. So um, I want to thank you all for your comments, and this has been extremely helpful, and your input was invaluable to this process. Dr. Bishop and I will meet with staff in the near future and review the comments and information provided and finalize the guidelines. It is our hope that we will be able to complete this document in the next couple of months so that it can be presented to our board at the October board meeting in San Diego. And once this document is approved by the board, it will be placed on the board's website and link will be emailed to all physicians. We do not plan, oh, we do maybe plan, we, we do plan on holding another meeting just to discuss the final draft. And I hope you will take the time to read it carefully and submit any comments today or between now and then and then to our executive director, uh, uh, Kim Kirchmeyer here. And um, if there are anybody out there in your field of, of knowledge that wasn't able to come today but you think maybe has some valuable input to give and share, please share the document with them. And we do plan to continue this task force. The next issue we want to pursue is looking at best practices. So several individuals have contacted us on ways to battle the epidemic of prescription over, uh, drug overdose. And we want to hear those ideas and use them to provide education to our physicians and to the public via our, via our newsletter, website, and other educational opportunities. And again, I want to thank you very much for your time. And just to remind you that this document is basically because we do discipline doctors in the state of California. That's where our emphasis has to be. But our consumer, since our primary interest is protecting of the consumer. The consumer needs to understand what this document is as well and be able to read it. So I want to thank you all for coming. And I guess we're going to adjourn the meeting. Okay? Thank you. You just had to end by being mean. <laughs>